Okay, picking up right from where we left off last time, we have written down the wave equation. We've understood its relationship to uh, you know uh, its different forms. Now we want to start solving the wave equation. So here I have it written down here in terms of pressure, um, and I've assumed that uh, we have a homogeneous sound speed. So I better write that down, make it official. You know, homogeneous sound speed. Um, and we want to find some solutions. So let's make our life a little bit easier and let's just write it down in one dimension. So we'll have, you know, this, this will just become the second order derivative in X minus one over C squared. So maybe that's a little more comfortable for you. And right away, of course, um, we can say, do the, the most wonderful thing ever in mathematics and physics. You say, uh, there's a general solution there's a general solution by inspection. And I'm sure this is familiar for all of you, but of course, you know that there is a function, any function with the form x minus ct or x plus ct, because they were second order derivatives. Um, we'll solve this, this above equation. So let's be clear here where F and G are arbitrary. Functions. And essentially it's easy to see what these two functions are, right? So they're um, traveling, okay? In two directions, right? In the positive, or I shouldn't say or, and negative direction, and they're not changing shape at all. So this general solution here actually has quite a lot of information in it, and it actually really describes something physically um, quite easy to imagine, right? So a disturbance and I'll say in P um, carrying energy and there's um, no loss, right? So it's not changing shape, so there's no loss. There's no dispersion, right? So there's no frequency dependent um, sound speed. Um, or you can think of it, there's no deformation. So all of that comes out very simply and very plainly. Now, one important thing we're going to need to solve these types of um, second order uh, partial differential equations are transforms. And the Fourier transform is our friend for many different reasons in this class. So let's just um, write a quick little definition of that here, okay? Define the Fourier transform. Okay. So we'll define an operator acts on a function in the uh, whoops. Sorry. Uh, no, shit. Okay. So we'll define an operator, f, acting on the function f of t. We have this 1 over 2 pi, it's 1 over root 2 pi out front. It's the integral from infinity to infinity function in the time domain minus e to the i omega t dt and of course omega is defined as 2 pi times the frequency. Wow, shouldn't have used function f, but oh well, whatever. Okay, and of course there's an inverse to that, right, taking your, your um, inverse operator which take your function from the frequency to domain to the time domain. But here all we want to do is just apply this 
to the wave equation. So we do that, we apply it to the, uh, the 3D wave equation, and we end up with spatial derivative. We've got a new variable k of x here multiplied by p. And just to be clear now, we're talking about p of x and omega in the frequency domain. OK, we need to define k. k is equal to omega over c, and that's the wave number, right? And so we have these nice relationship between these two functions, right? So we have our original p of x of t and p of x omega, and these are Fourier conjugate pairs, OK? And we'll do another little lecture looking at some, some familiar forms, some familiar useful forms of this, OK? So just for completeness sake, we have the transform. You know, we plug in, we can plug in um, p of x of t into there, and then we can get out p of x omega, right? For completeness sake, let's look at the inverse. Um, so if we want to get p of x of t, from p of x omega. Now this, this is just something to note here. This form with the square root of 2 pi is not always the form you'll see, whether it's in um, you know, a pre-written you know, pre computer fast Fourier transform code or in a textbook or a paper. Um, there are a few different forms of the Fourier transform, and they differ only by this normalization factor. So. Just keep a heads up on that. Um, so yeah, we take, we put in, um, and then here we're going to have the i omega t. Oops, no. Uh, yeah, okay, yes. Um, d omega, right? So the opposite, we had a minus sign there before, now we have a plus sign, and we'll define that as just f, the negative 1. P X Omega. Okay, so that gives us our inverse. So now let's go back to our one D um, our one D equation. So basically we had said that our solution, P of X of T, and now we're just X in one dimension, um, was actually going to be comp you know a composition of functions F and G. And we actually um, can construct these functions using Fourier decomposition, OK? So p of x of t, put the transform. X of K, and here I'm using K C T instead of um, omega D K. I'll, just, I'll write that down using omega equals C K right from our our definition of K, and we've changed the integral variable from omega to K. Just note that, and so P X of K. satisfies, actually this is just this plain old derivative, okay, this one-dimensional Helmholtz equation. Oops. Right, so the one-dimensional version of the Helmholtz equation that we had here. Wow, we didn't we never called this the Helmholtz equation. He would be so offended, I think. Put it in a circle. We'll make up for our our 
mistake there. Okay. So this equation looks very familiar, right? I'm assuming. This looks so familiar. You basically can't stop yourself from writing the solution. This is your classic second order ODE. We're no longer no longer a partial differential equation, right? So that's the miracle of the transform in, in helping us solve equations, right? So right away, we can basically write down the solution to this um, just out of our vast experience with ODEs. We know that it's some sort of linear combination of e to the i kx and e to the minus i kx, right? And how do you determine A and B? So th those depend on boundary conditions. And what are E to the I, K, X, and E to the minus I, K, X? Well, we could have also used cos and sine, so we know we're talking about some waves, and we know, of course, Euler's equation that relates complex exponential to sines and cosines. But what is another easy way to think of e to the i kx? Well, they're plane waves, right? Say so e to the plus or minus i kx are plane waves. And in 1D, like we have here, I just call them point waves. OK? So they're propagating with speed c. They're separated by distance 2 pi over k. OK? Propagating oops, speed c. Separated by 2 pi over k, which, of course, is the wavelength. And the full solution can then be written by combining all these things. Say p x of t c over root 2 pi. Now we're going to integrate that Helmholtz equation solution back into our original domain. So we have e to the i kx. We have b of k e to the minus i kx. And then we have our transform term here, e to the i k c t d k. Right, so here's the transform that's going to bring us from the, the k domain back into the t domain, which is what we wrote down in our uh, initial equation. Okay, And so that's, that's the full solution. Obviously, there's lots of detail missing there because we need to know the boundary conditions to define a and b, and then we can you know, write something a little bit more meaningful. Um, well, maybe not more meaningful. That's the wrong word, but more specific. So let's go back to our original 3D wave equation. So if we take the 3D wave equation, we saw that we can get the 3D Helmholtz equation by using the Fourier transform. So let's start there. Very convenient place to start. P. Oops. I'll write it all as just one uh, operator. Like I did before. X, K, zero. And of course, K here, my badly written K, is related to the frequency and the, and the wave speed. And so similarly, we have the same solution, right? So, okay, maybe it's not quite as familiar, but it's probably pretty familiar. We want to write this now just in 3D. In 3D. Similarly, we're going to say PXK is equal to AK e to the i k now being a vector, x being a vector, b of k e to the minus i k dot x. So now we really have plane waves. 
Julie have in the sense that, you know, we have waves propagating in some direction, K. They have this wavelength spacing. Oops, that's supposed to be a lambda. And the thing to note that, you know, everywhere in this plane, the phase of the wave is the same. That's really what makes them plane waves, right? K is this three component vector. Of course, I've drawn just uh, one zero zero, but uh, right? There's the wave vector. Tells you the direction. And um, of course, it satisfies this relationship uh, where we actually have a relationship to the wave number. It's just the norm, the standard norm of the vector. So kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared, the square root of that gives you the wave number. as well as being just the magnitude of the vector. So basically, what we're saying here is that the solution to the wave equation can be um, defined as plane waves, and the details of what those plane waves add up to be depend on the boundary conditions. Now. Let's go to um, another very familiar uh, geometry. So let's assume spherical symmetry. Okay. So our wave equation now becomes, so let's say, My God, my iPad's not being backed up. All right, a little levity, thanks to Apple. Um, so let's write our wave equation in spherical coordinates. So maybe a familiar thing, maybe you gotta look it up. Um, but we've got one over r squared, d by dr. r squared dp now in terms of, I'm gonna write r, t, um, d by dr, okay, and then we have minus 1 over c squared, and just our time derivative remains unchanged, of course, and actually we don't really need the arrow over the r, I guess that's sort of superfluous, because uh, we have spherical symmetry, we've already assumed that, and here, just to define r, r is x squared plus y squared, plus z squared, right? So similarly, we can, you know, find a solution by inspection, okay? And of course, convince yourself that this is true. Um, very similar, r minus ct, but now we have to put a one over r out front to take care of this, the, the form of the derivative over here. Um, and we can have gr plus ct over r. So again, just like we had with the, on, the, on the line, we said there's gonna be you know a disturbance that's propagating one way, disturbance that's propagating the other way, that's gonna be our plus and minus um, ct. Now we have simply a wave that's propagating outwards and a wave that's propagating inwards. We say all solutions, all solutions to this equation are defined in terms of these wave propagating outwards, wave propagating inwards. And so a special case of that is of course these spherical waves, okay? So we would have something like AK, E to the I, K, r minus ct over r plus bk e to the minus i k r plus ct 
over R, of course. And so this gives you this special case, right? Is really just talking about um, waves from a point source. at the origin. Okay, so that gives us the simplest possible solutions um, to the wave equation. And of course, as we go on the course, we are going to get more specific about our environment, more specific about the constraints in our solution, and that's going to give us more practical, more well-defined um, solutions to this equation. And wow, it's going to open up a whole world of interesting stuff. So thank you. <laughs>